So thank you guys, everyone, for coming this evening. It's a very informal. We're kind of chilling, aren't we? So I'm Elizabeth Brookwell Banks. I hope I've met everybody. I believe I have. Thank you so much for coming. This is our inaugural event in our Bloodworks Live studio. So you guys are the uh, premier, premier attendees. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have one more song by our wonderful artist. This is Naomi Washira. Um, she's Kenyan-born singer-songwriter. So one more, and then she's headed out to open for um, Ziggy at the zoo. Ziggy Marley. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I have like this really bad cold, so I apologize if I sound like a frog. But <laughs> um, so it's such an honor to be here, and. Uh, um, I'm sorry I didn't talk much when I was singing earlier, but um, I want to do one song for you guys before I leave. Uh, this is a song that um, comes from um, a Zulu word called Ubuntu. I don't know if you're familiar with that word. And it basically means, when you like direct translation, means I am because you are, you are because I am. And it's this really beautiful way of looking at humanity and realizing that what makes us human is not just me like I can't be human by myself I need other people to help me be human um and so I ended up like writing a song about this and like a lot of times when I do like these fundraiser events like I always talk about like you know you guys are so privileged and have so much abundance and like and part of like that humanity sharing this humanity is that you extend that abundance to other people um through your gifts your talent your money your time your energy all of that um and I think it's like in a small way trying to you know make this world a little bit better. Um, so anyway, so this song goes something like this. I've been wondering, I've been trying to figure out who this brown skin girl is. I've been on a quest, I've been on a journey, trying to understand why on earth I am here. Discovered I am the sum of everybody I've met. Some have blessed me, some have cursed me, some have held me down, and others pushed me aside. And then there are those who sat beside me, we laughed and we cried. I've been pondering. I've been trying to find the thread, the invisible thread that binds us together. Yeah, yeah. And I've discovered we are the same in our existence. Sometimes we're afraid, sometimes we are bold, sometimes we can't fight, and other times we just run and run and run and run. Our days it feels like we're back on the playground again Defending our right to exist Defending our right to exist I am cause you are You are cause I am So be kind to me And I'll do the same for you Whoa. Tell me, and I'll 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to start our program. Thank you again for so much for coming. I want to introduce a couple of people to come to this stage. Um, really why we're here tonight to hear their stories. So we'll start with Molly Firth. Molly is a board member with Bloodworks Northwest. She has a tremendous story to share that I will not uh, spoil that. But she came down from Seattle today. So if you want to come join us on the stage, thank you, Molly. We have Teresa Thomas Massengale. Teresa is our uh, chief in, uh, chief partnership and investment and partnership officer. Um, also down from Seattle with us today, and we have Dr. Yan Wu, who's our chief medical officer with Bloodworks Northwest. Well, thank you, everyone. I think everyone here knows me. Knows it's dangerous to give me a mic. I have some great jokes today, so I hope everyone's here to be positive. Oh, oh. Anyway, so um, a little levity before we get into a very serious and incredibly compelling topic. Um, when we think about um, the, the extraordinary and stunning impact that Bloodworks has every day, every minute, <laughs> Um, throughout the Pacific Northwest and the world. Um, we, those of us that know bl Bloodworks really well, um, it's just an honor to serve that mission and to see that enacted in front of us all the time. Makes all the Excel sheets and the long meetings and the struggles with um, traffic, and it absolutely makes every minute you know, a joy. Um, but really what we're trying to do is bring light and sh share the stories that, that really are a part of all that and the expertise that saves lives every day and the lives that are saved. So it's just um, an honor to be here and serve as a, moder a moderator, the two gals that um, really I'm inspired and honored to work with. So Molly, can you tell us a little bit about your story and what brought you to get involved with Bloodworks and to serve as a trustee. Thank you. Um, so I uh, worked in health policy. I've worked in health policy for the last 13 years. I have a public health degree. Currently having a public health degree does not mean that you know anything about maternal mortality and morbidity because I went into the hospital to have my child and uh, woke up in the ICU the next day. And uh, it wasn't what I expected. Um, I suffered a postpartum hemorrhage. I uh, saw my child come out, saw, heard that it was a girl when I had a C-section, was overjoyed because we didn't know what we were having. Uh, we're one of those. Mom's still mad about that. Um, it was a very stressful nine months for everyone. Um, but I, you know, I soon lost consciousness. And when I woke up in the ICU, I was very confused. I didn't know where I was. I knew I was in a hospital. I didn't know why I was there. I was like, was I in an accident? 
was, did I have a baby? Like it, it, I was so confused. And I found out then that I had had a seven unit blood transfusion. I was endlessly grateful immediately for all of the amazing blood donors out there. And, um, it really just gave me pause about, you know, how close I was to not making it. Um, and I started to learn more about maternal mortality and morbidity over the last year and a half. Uh, this was two and a half years ago almost. And, uh, come to find out that it's actually quite a quite a big problem in the United States. And that was a little shocking to me that I had no idea of it, even though I ha am a public health and policy professional. So uh, it was an honor when somebody told me about Bloodworks looking for board members. Uh, she had been asked to be on the board and couldn't. And she was like, hey, you, <laughs> you would be great. And I was like, yes, yes, absolutely. Sign me up. I want to give back. I want to do more. Um, we have, since I've given blood many times, I got my gallon pin. You guys, I'm very excited about my gallon pin. I wear it prominently on my coat. If anybody looks at it even a little bit, I'm like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, I give blood. Let's talk about it. Uh, so it, it, donating blood is such a beautiful and amazing thing to do, and it's such an easy thing to do. Um, but now I also get to give back in a different way and raise awareness about this issue and raise awareness and support this amazing organization. So, so your story is um, stunning, and um, I think when we when we began to work together to get into this issue more deeply, and we you know, uh, combed through the literature and we heard really what a growing problem this is. Um, I think a lot of folks, there was a lot of like jaws dropped. So could you talk a little bit about what postpartum hemorrhage actually is mm -hmm. and some of the, the disturbing... Um, uh, imagery? Yes, no. <laughs> not, not the imagery, the data, dear. Let's focus on the data. She loves the imagery, though. Um, so, And she loves the data, so I'm just surprised she's actually going to let me say any of it. Right. Okay, so um, postpartum hemorrhage is when uh, there is excessive blood loss at the time of delivery or within 24 hours after. So it, any doctor will tell you it's normal to bleed after delivery. <laughs> yes, it's normal to bleed a little bit. It is not normal to use, lose liters of blood. So um, some blood loss, yes. A lot, no. Um, so it, at, it actually is becoming so much more common in the United States. Um, and that's actually the part that is so confusing because you would think that as the postpartum hemorrhage rates are declining worldwide and in third world countries uh, even, uh, it would actually be doing something you know pretty good in the United States. But actually, it's increased 183%. Uh, in the last 10 years. This is Teresa's favorite stat, so I'm really happy she let me share it. Um, and that is phenomenal. Like, why are we letting this happen? So th what this means is that we have, you know, on the order of 50,000 women a year who are suffering from severe mor maternal morbidity, which is usually characterized by a postpartum hemorrhage, um, that you know, is happening at the time of the delivery of their child. You don't go into the hospital thinking that you might not make it through. Um, and then we have um, every day two women die in childbirth in the United States. And that's appalling. That should not be happening in the United States. So those are the, those are the stats that I like to talk about. I mean, most of this is preventable. That's the part that is really the most jarring. But the only solution, the main solution, the, the solution you need to be able to figure out what other measures that you need to take to save someone's life is having blood transfusions, having blood on hand that is safe and can be transfused immediately. So that's, that's the kind of the main thing about postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah, I think um, only one thing I'd I if you could talk a little bit about the health disparities issues that are involved oh, in the, in the yes. situation and how um, extraordinary that is. It's incredible. So I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm a white woman who gave birth at, in an urban area <laughs> um, and I'm you know, relatively middle class. Uh, if you are Native American or an African American woman and you go into childbirth, you are going to have far less 
good outcomes. So that is something that's been well documented across the United States. Um, African American women are three times more likely to die in childbirth, which is not okay. And so when you look at these disparities, I mean, these are disparities that are happening throughout all of our health, right? This is an overall health disparity, but yet it's so prevalent for this one statistic that shouldn't be even happening. Yeah, the, the, the health disparities issue is stark. I think many people who use language like health disparities or health equities would, would look at this as a, a maternal health as a health disparities issue in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Then when you drill down, you start looking at other categories. It, it really is, um, my grandmother would say, um, a situation like this is so many opportunities to do good. She had... had um, had a way to accentuate the positive. Um, I think when we look at how stark the situation is and um, how really it is just minutes that matter during that um, health uh, incident, you really get to where the kind of medical expertise that Yan Wu brings um, really makes an extraordinary difference. It's another way in, in, in that blood works contributes to the solutions to these problems. Providing the blood, but actually training um, uh, the whole infrastructure in healthcare to respond to these situations. So, uh, Dr. Wu, can you tell us more about what Bloodworks does today to make childbirth? So, they gave me a script, I have to tell you, but I usually don't follow that, so just forgive me. And she um, writes protocols. <laughs> and Teresa just told you, be positive. I'm going to say, we can use some negative, too, sometimes. I can tell you why. Mm. Um, so oh. we... <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. And why is that? Why we always need a lot of all negative blood? We always ask. We ask, we ask, we ask. The reason is we try to protect moms, future moms. That's exactly the reason we want to have O's on shelf everywhere all the time. Not just O's, particular O neck is to protect the mom being sensitized so they won't become the cause of death for their baby in the future. And that's exactly, we have this maternal mind and that's why we always ask for O negative. So that's the protocol that we in place, basically implement everywhere that we promote that practice. So everywhere, if you want to have some sort of a unprepared emergency bleed package, we ask for all negative blood. So as a result of that, we need a lot of all negative blood. And we never get enough because the entire population it's only probably about 4% or uh, not 4% that's AB. It's about, you know, 40%. But when you come to O negative, it's a lot less. So basically, we don't have enough O negative blood to go around. But we want to protect uh, every mom out there to really help their baby. So that's sort of a, my main message. So it's OK to use some a negative sometimes. <laughs> So on top of that, um, we do a lot. We touch a lot of things, uh, really from arm to arm. We touch on the donor side to protect um, the females. We touch on the, um, the patient side to protect the mom and the baby. And I can give you two examples on that extreme. So on the donor side, you know, we have a policy implemented to have the mom, um, basically, if they just have a pregnancy or basically have a delivery, we don't want them to donate for a certain time. The reason is we want to make sure they recover the ions. In the meantime, we also tell the donors, if you donate blood, especially the red cells, take some ions. We want to make sure they don't accumulate, have iron loss because of donation. So we put a lot of emphasis on make sure our donors are healthy. A lot of them are potential moms, and some are moms just recovered. So that's sort of one arm of the story. Then on the other end is really the moms. Um, sometimes, again, not just the mom, it's the baby. So I would say, you know, when we were in, um, I think last year when we were in Olympia at the um, basically try to lobby, not the lobby, basically try to convince the 
advocate advocate, advocate try to convince the <laughs> the government doing the right thing for us uh, so I will get calls that's a good thank you so much so I will go call from emergency room uh, physician or sometimes the OB physician basically they have a baby they're really having issues because the mom usually has antibody against the baby in those cases if we don't treat managing properly the mom's antibody is really an immunity could potentially destroy the baby and the baby could die so in those cases we will try to give the blood to the mom or sometimes directly to the fetus and to really to make sure they're healthy um, so the mom could have a good in outcome as was the baby so in those cases where we are really providing the expert tea area is you know what, what we know exactly what antibody they have uh, we're the lab that really performing those tests and we know which one is clinically important which one is not what kind of blood we want to match this is also the area we rely on a diverse blood donors because when you have those sort of immunity antibodies, that means only people that they don't have that antigen or the, then they can basically make the anti antibody against others. So in those cases, they tend to be um, people with a diverse background. So to support those efforts, we really need to have a donor that's very diversified, which is really we don't have enough of that in the community. In the US in general, so we have see a sharp increase in our patient population, very, very diverse. On the other hand, we don't see that in our donor population. So it's really become a potential, a, a medical crisis and potentially public health crisis for the future. Okay. So should I go back to the script or you want me to go to the next one? Yeah. <laughs> Rain it in, Wu. Rain it in. <laughs> um, well, you know what I want you to do is go around the world. Tell us what Bloodworks does globally. Oh. To protect moms. I thought that was what you're going to say. But I'll be happy no, to do that. Right? <laughs> okay. So we it do. Literally is you. Oh, literally is me. That's fine. So we are. Um, because of sort of our expertise area, so we do a lot of education. So we do, you know, we go to different countries to educate people, like in Africa or in China or our different parts of country, um, different part of the world. So we do basically going out to educate them, help them to get to write the policy, and that's the right medication, for example, uh, right medical practice. For example, uh, I've been going to China for many, many years, and they actually don't even do the things we do here, like screening the mom for antibody or screening the donor for antibody. We've been working with them for many, many years. And just this year, they are going to change the policy. They're going to start to screening the donors. They're going to start screening for patients. So our work does have a lot of a positive impact. Um, then we also bring people from all over the place to come to learn how we practice. So we have people from, you know, of course, China. African, uh, and then you know sometimes come individuals stay here for half a year or a year. Sometimes they come as a group for two weeks. So we do a lot of those education. So last night, and I had a uh, sort of education meeting through Skype and uh, to our colleague in Afghanistan. So we do that sort of thing. We just do. Uh, we love. We enjoy. Um, but we also have um, our sort of a really go out there in particular help the issue with women bleeding to death. Um, so our chief medical officer, Linda Brown, our one of our uh, medical colleagues, Dr. Megan Delini. So they have this creative idea to try to create this so-called blood pack, which is really helping those country, they don't have a way to store blood or to collect blood. So they really put everything in a little backpack. So when there is a patient that's bleeding need the blood, so basically they have a walking blood banking. They just go to the people in the village, ask people to donate, they test them and they give the patient right then. Is that enough? That's great. <laughs> yeah, and so I think a lot of that work really falls under the, um, it, it adheres closely to WHO guidelines for what they call national health system strengthening. So Dr. Wu and her colleagues are advising national m ministries of health on their blood policy. And when, when you look at um, issues of infectious disease, um, uh, certainly health, the um, 
health overall and the role of labs and testing, sort of how healthcare, you know, as the most frequently provided m- medical procedure in the world, every two seconds globally, every six seconds in the United States, it really is key to, it's a, it's a, a structuring pillar of healthcare. And so to be able to build the whole infrastructure of a country and really help raise that, as we know, uh, modern health care that we're, we're, we are, um, well, many of us, I'll say, are used to in the United States, that level of health care is spreading globally at an extraordinary rate. And Bloodworks is deeply a part of that. And um, we think about the extraordinary social impact that, of our work. Like someone's getting a blood transfusion today in Portland because of our role that where we are really are a steward, where we help one part of the community save the life of another part of the community through their blood donation and their generosity. And to be a steward there in partnership, literally arm to arm, it is so much what um, Naomi's song was really about. It was incredibly poignant when you think of it in terms of blood donation and how you know, who, whoever were the individuals that saved your life or so many lives in this room, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to be a part of. And so if we ha- either of you have any concluding comments, we've sort of reached the sort of end of the script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got to it yet. <laughs> but um, we're certainly willing to take questions for the audience. But if you have any final comments. I would just say that, uh, you know, I think this country needs to get its act together around maternal mortality and morbidity around how we treat moms, new moms. And um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think Bloodworks is really part of the solution. We absolutely need to make sure that there are blood donors out there because I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for blood donors. Um, That's why I give back. Um, But, you know, there aren't as many people giving blood these days. Uh, It's not the same culture that it used to be. And so I think, you know, just remembering that it is important and there are are people like me who are out there who you know my daughter she is adorable she has a mom because I am here today to be driven crazy yes my mother has a granddaughter she reminds me of that all the time it's very important having a granddaughter daughter eh, granddaughter real exciting um I get it I get it I will All remember right, that. Way to emphasize the maternal <laughs> health theme this evening. <laughs> but yes, we need to have more blood donors out there. And so just, you know, making sure that people remember stories like this when they are contemplating if they should spend an hour going to give some blood. Um, and, you know, also just raising awareness. I, I honestly had no idea that this was a problem in our country, and I'm a little ashamed of that. Uh, and yet, it shouldn't be a problem, so that's why I was ignorant. And ignorance is bliss sometimes, especially when you're pregnant. So, um, you know, I just, I, I want people to understand that this is an issue. Uh, we clearly need to work on policies to do something about it um but in the meantime in fact yes (laughs) in fact i spent some time thinking about that and i'm very hopeful that we will be able to make some important changes um but uh you know first we're starting with even looking at maternal mortality not quite looking at maternal morbidity as closely yet um which we need to get to but really two moms dying a day in the united states in childbirth is two moms too many so we need to curb that trend and then look at the 50,000 women who are coming close to death every year. That's just, it's not okay and we need to do better. I have a question. So thinking about obviously who wins if we have policy that supports women, why not get the insurance companies to mandate that if you are insured, you get blood, number one, and also it hedges their risk huh. for losing somebody. That I don't like it. Well, I'm sure. We're we'll going to have to talk after. We'll talk more. <laughs> so since becoming involved with Bloodworks, I've been talking to folks about their thoughts, perceptions, habits around donating blood. And I, not with respect to Bloodworks specifically, but generally. And I've encountered the same theme, which is, I don't give blood anymore because I have shown up there 
filled out that paperwork and got stood in line, and then they told me they can't take my blood for some cockamamie reason. But then I go home, and three days later, I get a phone call from them saying, why haven't you donated blood? Um, and one of the things that I've been impressed with and actually interested and intrigued by with blood work is the concept around looking at how do we start to break down some of these older, not necessarily um, consistent with today's technology and processes around um, protecting and making sure the blood supply is safe. So I was wondering if, I don't think I have all the information I probably should have around that, but I think that's a huge, um, you know, challenge we've got to start talking about. Well, I'm just going to repeat that because we are streaming this on Facebook live so i'm not 100 percent sure our audience can hear that so to summarize You'll do it more don bonders <laughs> um discussion she's talking a little asking about what is being done to modernize not only it sounds like the ways that blood donors are contacted but the, um, the types and um uh, status of the federal drug administration's deferral policies and I think there's a lot there's a very rich conversation there and I certainly have stuff to say but I'm going to defer to an actual expert <laughs> so Yan did you have anything on that sure we are definitely looking for advanced technology and be able to basically remove some of those barriers NIH are and FDA as well as the multiple blood centers are working on those so it will be a sort of stepwise approach eventually we'll get there for sure when that happens we would love to have your partnership for sure thank you yeah and and when we talk about how we reach out and uh, we, we talk about how we contact donors, what's our relationship as an organization, only speaking about blood works, of course. We talk about the trends in blood donation across the ages, certainly across diverse communities. There's like those rates vary wildly, and we know they're trending downwards. So there are many things we are doing as an organization to make sure we're able to meet that mission and have that blood in place. Um, Activities like this, sponsoring a radio station studio and having folks in to not only hear music and hang out and get to meet and connect and network, but also have a little stimulation and raise awareness about public health issues and how those are met specifically by giving blood. And, you know, tying to themes like maternal health, because it turns out almost everyone has a mom. <laughs> and um, it turns out that that is an important, important way that we can um, achieve our mission through looking at policy issues. You know, if you're if you're here tonight or you're on Facebook, you'll be you'll be among the first people to know when our new um, donor engagement platform is available. And Bloodworks Blood Donors will be able to download an app, schedule, f use a, a mapping technology to find their closest available location give today give now we'll be able to reach out and say wow we've had three postpartum hemorrhages hopefully we'll be zero but we've had a, a need for blood we have o negative need it's close to you so we're really using all of that um sort of the weight and excitement of modern technology to help revolutionize the way we are communicating with blood donors and attract a younger audience. Because it really is, I think, what I love working with so many millennials, Kristen, <laughs> yeah, is that, I mean, I think a lot of folks know that besides killing everything, <laughs> millennials are statistically much more philanthropically motivated. They are giving more, uh, a greater percent of their income, they're giving a greater percent of their time than any generation historically. And it's up to us, so the opportunity there is to be able to meet them um, where they're at and transition them that love and that um, incredible um, participation and pride that they bring to uh, to all generations and transition that into blood donation. It's right there waiting for us to do it. And so I think Portland, uh, Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, the culture of giving and true community engagement, we could be um, the place that solves that problem. And that will be good for everyone. 
I agree. I'm going to return this back to you. Okay. I don't need a script. I just want to say, other than blood donation, we do do a lot of research, a clinical study, really try to figure out why women bleed, and when they bleed, what practice is the best practice. So we'd really love to have your partnership with us on those journey. Thank you so much. Any more questions? to the donors because we're kind of forgetting the donors and the last time I donated I actually received about a you know a few weeks later an email that told me that my donation had been used for a young man oh. in Seattle who had gotten in a car accident that got me I mean that was so important that just brought everything full circle and if we can expand that because I know most a lot of the hospitals don't tell you, you know, where the blood is going or if it's been used, that That's just cool. made it real. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that was a very powerful thing and it just makes me want to donate more. That's very cool. Well, mm -hmm. first of all, thank you for being a registrar, thank you for being a blood donor. And yes, that's a, that sort of spark and the, and, um, the, the chill that folks get of excitement when they realize that they really are saving a life and they know specifically right now uh, I've done something unbelievable. Um, that's something we hear over and over again. And that is a capacity that's built into the new app and sharing stories like Molly's stories more and more being in the public eye to really draw, close that loop. Like you, you're, you've, um, so, uh, wonderfully articulated right now. I think that is the secret to transitioning folks to really building a healthy culture of blood donation. So every story we can share, believe me, we are, we are um, mining those stories and trying to get that information out. So I appreciate so much everything you said. Yes, mother. Yes, mother. <laughs> Molly, would you like to tell the group what you did for Clara's first birthday party? Yes, so uh, on Clara's first birthday party, um, we hosted a blood drive and um, it was, you know, the one year anniversary of my transfusion, so it meant I could give again, which I was very excited about, and uh, basically bullied everyone else into coming and giving blood, and we collected 20 units, I believe, that day, and it was just really nice because one of our friends, who was also a new parent, who we met through a new parent group, uh, had never given blood, was terrified of needles, basically like me, can't look, can't look at all, has to look away, but he was like, I will do this for you. And I was like, okay, let's do it. Come on. He now goes every two months, like clockwork, Aww. and he is really trying to compete with me. So if I get off in slack at all, he's like, hey, hey, look at me. I just went and give, gave blood. I'm like, dang it. So we are in fierce competition now, and it is lovely to me because he probably never would have given blood if it weren't for hearing my story, being around us, understanding what it meant for me to have received the blood that I received. And that's, that's for me is so meaningful because now I feel like it's my mission to convert all of our friends <laughs> into dedicated blo blood donors. And believe me, uh, I think today, because today is World Blood, blood Donor Day. That's right. So happy World Blood Donor Day, that's a mouthful. Um, and uh, so I actually put something on Facebook already and was like, and who's going to come give blood with me? Uh, I'm eligible soon. Who wants to do it? And so. Where are my O's at? Doing? O's. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> at Blood Works knows my blood type, by the way. <laughs> o positive. <laughs> we have any more questions? Well, um, I'm honored to share the stage with two rock stars, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of Bloodworks Live Studio. And um, thank you so much. A lot of council members here, Dr. Jim Abishon, our president and CEO there, um, a registrar and a blood donors. Um, it's just, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Elizabeth and Kristen, for putting this all together, and thank you, everyone. And good night.